Morning. morning. Happy Easter. So great to see so many people, even in this now second hour, all these people, many I haven't seen. I wish every Sunday was Easter. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe that's a pastor thing. But it's great to be with you to celebrate uh, this great day and not celebrate just Easter. We all know the word Easter, but we're celebrating really the, the, the single greatest event in the history of the world. That's a bold statement, but really it's the single greatest event in the history of the world was when the Son of God, yes, came into the world, but rose from the dead, conquered death and conquered sin, and made a way uh, for people, uh, as, as uh, was just said, as Amanda just said, to connect with God. So that's what we're going to talk about this morning as we celebrate Easter Sunday together. For 2,000 years, you know this, the cross, symbol one of them above my head, has been the center of the Christian faith, right? You see it dotted all over uh, the landscapes, on churches, hospitals, you know, you name it, all around the world, the cross. And it's, it is the cent- uh, center of the Christian faith because, of course, what happened there on the cross. I'm talking about the cross of Jesus. God sent his son, I think the Galatians talks about the gospel being a rescue mission. So that's the exact words in Galatians chapter 1. So God sent his son into the world on a rescue mission. Now, what was that rescue mission? Long before he died on a cross, he lived a life, some 30 years. What's the point of that life? That's part of the gospel too. He lived a life that was in perfect conformity to the law. He lived a quality of life that no other person has ever lived. Not your grandmother, not Mother Teresa, not anybody in the world has ever lived. So first, he lived a life that no one else could live. He did that for you. He did that for me. Then, also in conformance to the law of God, he died on a cross. But it was a sacrificial atonement. Very much like the animals that were slain on the altar, but in this case it was a human sacrifice on a cross for the atonement, not of two or three people or one family, but atonement for the sins of the world. But the gospel, the good news, it doesn't end at the cross. It leads somewhere. It makes way for the resurrection. And the resurrection, we're going to look at it just for a few minutes this morning, is not just about a new life for Jesus. Yes, that's significant. Yes, we're celebrating that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. But that's not it. We're not just celebrating this on behalf of somebody else. We're celebrating not just a new life for Jesus, but an offer of new life, the quality of life, we're going to see here in a minute, for anybody who's open to it, for you and for me. It is, title of my message, a life beyond belief, really. It's hard to imagine. It's hard to believe. Luke chapter 24, if you have a copy of the Bible, you can open it or... Turn, turn your phone on, so to speak, and follow and read these words, my text for this morning, Luke 24, 36 to 43, in the last chapter of Luke's gospel. While they were still talking, we're kind of in the middle of the movie, and who is while, who are they? They is the apostles and a few other friends, and they're in this kind of closed room because Jesus had been crucified, and they're kind of confused. They don't know what's going on. And while they're talking about the event that had just happened a few minutes before, Jesus himself stood among them, in other words, he appeared, and said, peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, why are you troubled, and why do your doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet, it is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, do you have anything here to eat? 
They gave him a piece of broiled fish. He took it and ate it in their presence. A life beyond belief. If you're familiar with the Gospels at all, if you've read the Gospel stories or heard it, it, you might wonder, as I did, as I was thinking about this passage, at the response of that was just read of, of, of these people in this room, mostly the apostles. What do I mean is they're startled, they're, they're shocked, they're troubled. They're, it's disbelief. You know, it's like, what, what's going on here? And I say it's a, it's, it's, I'm, I'm, it's a shock or it's a wonder because these friends, not everyone else in the world, the living of that day, but Jesus had told them at least three times. Now, if there's three times recorded in the Bible, it was probably more than three We don't have everything recorded. But at least three times so that we'll know this, he looked them in the face dispassionately and said, listen, this is how this story is going to end. I'm going to be arrested. I'm going to be killed. And on the third day, I'm going to rise from the dead. So take heart. But but it's one thing to hear somebody tell you that, even someone like Jesus. And it's another thing to see it. The person who you saw crucified. I mean, so what they witnessed, if we believe the Bible's record, was, was an excruciating death. You know, it wasn't like they just, somebody, it happens real quickly. You know, it's kind of a quick execution. No, it's an excruciating death. We know he had nails in his hands, nails in his feet, pierced his side, a, a crown of thorns on his head. He had been flogged. He was a bloody mess, and it was for hours. And he slowly suffocated and died. That's the last thing they saw. So to hear it, it's one thing, but to see that person who had died that kind of death now standing in front of you in a sound mind, doing well, sounding well, is a shock, of course. And we also learn, not in Luke 24, but in the book of Acts, that after the shock was over, they spent 40 days together. It's hard to believe. I don't, well, you never hear sermons on this. But Jesus, because we don't know a lot about what happened, but for 40 days, a month and, a, and more, Jesus, the resurrected Jesus. Can you imagine? They went to dinner. They took walks. We don't know what they did. They spent 40 days together. But here's the thing. We don't know anything about what they talked about in those 40 days. You know? We don't know anything about what they did. That's God's business or the writer's business. But this is what we know. And I'm assuming that what is shared here and in the resurrection passages are the most important things we need to know. What do we need to know, here's the point of my sermon, about life on the other side of death? What do I need to know? What do you need to know about life on the other side of death, if you're a Christian here, that the the resurrected Jesus illustrates for you and me? That's the point of this sermon. Number one. That this life is better than you could ever imagine. Okay? It's better than you can ever imagine. Jesus here has a qualitatively different body. We just know pieces from when we read all the resurrection accounts. But we know it has the limitations of his old body are gone. I'm sure the emotional heaviness and the passion he had, you know, of, of, of the suffering, that's gone. Okay? But it is very much a real body. Okay, I know some of us, what your background is, you know, you think heaven's this sort of, you know, your soul goes up there and it's just sort of floating around. Nothing about that is biblical. It's a real body. Jesus is trying to make that point. He says, listen, touch me. Feel me. It's me. This, it is I myself. It's a re- and even ask for something to eat. I'm sure this is here. Many scholars have said this for years. Because, not because Jesus was hungry. He wants to make a point. I'm not a ghost. Ghosts don't eat. Okay? That's what he's trying to say. It's a real body. It's personal, too. It's personal. It is, he's saying to people who are still on this side of heaven, so to speak, he's saying to the disciples, it's me. Think about that. It's personal. This, all of this should be uh, communicating to us about what life is like after death. But Jesus is not simply letting us know that he conquered death but he's showing us the life to come. How do I know that? Philippians 3, I'm not going to quote it, but it says, or I'm not going to go to it, but it says, listen, when Jesus Christ comes back, he will transform our bodies to be like his glorious body. So pay attention, because this isn't just a story about Jesus, it's a story about you. Okay? It's a story about anybody who knows Christ and has the hope of Christ within them. 
People say, often say to me, and I mean some pastors forever, you know, tell me about heaven. What's heaven going to be like? And, and there's not a lot in the Bible about heaven. And I think the reason is because by definition, it's a different reality. Heaven is not, I want to break your, uh, 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 your categories here, heaven is not fundamentally a place like it's over there. You know, it's that direction or that direction or that direction. We often think of that. Heaven is not a place other than it's the place where God is, maybe. Heaven is a dimension of reality. Okay, that's what heaven is. It's a dimension of reality. And because you and I don't have the capacity to have a letter written to us, God says, I'm going to send forth my son. In a manner of speaking, I'm going to send the future into the present so you can see it. Jesus is that reality. It's a life beyond belief, okay? That's what you're seeing. And according to this passage, what is it? Well, we don't know everything, but it's a life without sin. It's a life without death. Listen, it's a life without fear. Now, just think for a minute. Forget about all the other things that eternal life might mean, right? Just think for a minute what your life would be like if you could live 24 hours without any fear at all about anything. This is what you see. It's a life beyond belief. You're seeing Jesus illustrate it right here. For sure, this life, three things are true just from this passage. You have a body. Okay? You're not floating around. You have personal relationships. This is what Jesus is trying to communicate. It's me. It's me. It's the same guy you knew a month ago and two years ago. It's me. You have a body. It's a personal relationship. And there's joy and amazement. What does that mean? The things that we love and the people that we love will not cease to exist, but will be perfected, made right, made whole in every way. Now, that's a hard, that's, it's, it's, it's kind of hard to believe, but that's what the Bible's saying. That's what Jesus is communicating here. It's a life without belief. C.S. Lewis, if you know the name, middle of the 20th century, at one of the hardest, most difficult times in the world, in the beginning of World War II, gave a series of, 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 of um, radio talks and sermons. One of the most famous is called The Weight of Glory. You could read it today. It's not long. It's a sermon, written sermon. And in the, what he means by the weight of glory, that's his way of talking about and when people thought the world was coming in, what is our lives going to be like? He's talking about literally the glorified body, the weight of glory, you and me. This is what he says. Relationship between this life and the next life. We want to be united with the beauty we see that is today. To become part of it. That is why the poets tell us such lovely falsehoods. They tell us that beauty will pass into the human face, but it won't, not yet. At present, we are on the outside of this world, the wrong side of the door, but all the leaves of the New Testament are rustling with the rumor that it will not always be so. Someday, God willing, we shall get in. Now, does that mean, Rob, that all the good things that you long for today or all the good things that you long for in this life and didn't get the marriage that never happened or lasted, the kids that never came, the career that never materialized, the dreams that you had for your life that never came true. Are what you're saying, Rob, is all those things, I'm going to get them in the next life? Is that what you're telling me? And I would say, I would be saying more than I know, honestly and truthfully, to say, yes, you're going to get those. But I do believe it will be far more than anything you've ever longed for. Why do I say that? Paul, will, Paul answers the same question in 1 Corinthians about heaven. He said, listen. He said, tell us what heaven's all. And he says, listen, one verse. The eye has not seen, the ear has not heard, neither has it entered into the mind of men and women the things that God has prepared for them that love him. You say, Paul, why are you, being so, why are you holding back? You say, listen, heaven's a different dimension of reality. You live in this one. I can't tell you, but I can show you. Okay? It will be far more than you ever dreamed, far more than you ever imagined. Some of you know if you're part of this church, you've heard me tell the story that uh, my father died when I was young. In that sense, single parent household, 
by um, that event. He died when I was, I'm the youngest of six kids, I was only four months old. So what that means is I never knew him. I never had a conversation with him. I don't have a single memory of him. And for most of my life, maybe this is true for my siblings, but for most of my life, I didn't think about him. I I certainly had no memories to draw from, no conversations to recall, all the way into my adult life. But about five years ago, um, I was the first time that I can remember anyway, five years ago, and here I am, 38, you know, no, but, you know, five years ago, five years ago was the first time I can remember ever going to visit my father's grave by myself, Lake Avenue, Holy Sepulcher. But lately, in, since that time, I've been thinking about it, and very recently, had the most unusual experience Very, very recently. I was just driving my car, going home, and all of a sudden, I know some of you had this kind of experience. I was, in this case, I was thinking about my dad. I don't even know why. I don't even remember the reason. And all of a sudden, I had this overwhelming emotional experience. I started to weep. Weep so much that I had to stop and pull over. And I thought, what in the world is going on? And it went, this, this went on for five minutes. And once it was over, I thought to myself, what in the world was that about? And I know it wasn't because I was missing him, because I have nothing to miss. But I, as I thought about it, I said, I wasn't missing him, but I was feeling, maybe for the first time, his absence in my life. And I'll tell you this, I don't know my dad's politics. I don't know what his favorite sports team was. I don't know if he was a follower of Jesus. I, Some things make me think that he was, but if he was, the first person I want to see on the other side of that door is him, right? It's a life beyond belief. It's personal. It's, it is me, Jesus says. Do you believe that? Do I believe that? Second thing you see in this passage, you don't see it coming, okay? Verse 44, you don't see it coming, this life. He said to them, They're still a little shocked. This is what I told you when I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets. Some of the things you've seen and some of the things you haven't bothered looking at. Then he opened their minds so that they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations. Beginning at Jerusalem, you are witnesses of these things. And I'm going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city, Jerusalem, until you've been clothed with power from on high. Think about this. This should also raise a question for you. Then he opened their mind to the Scriptures. Well, hadn't they been with him for the last three years? Hadn't Jesus himself been teaching the scriptures? In fact, we have, there's many examples, but the most easy shorthand one is the Sermon on the Mount, the most famous sermon of Jesus. It takes three whole chapters in the Bible where Jesus basically unpacks the meaning of the Ten Commandments. We know the disciples were there. So what does it mean that he opened their mind to the scriptures? What it must mean is this. There's something that was significant, that namely the resurrection, that they could not understand until now. The resurrection was the key to the meaning of the whole Bible. And because of it, now he opens their understanding. What is that that he unpacks for them? This is what is written. Okay, He opens their minds to understand the Scriptures. This is what is written. Circle this. The Messiah will suffer. Now listen very carefully. What is he saying? What is the Messiah? What the word Messiah is not is also translated sometimes Christ. It's not Jesus' last name. The word Messiah is a is a is a um, a technical term, a theological term that means anointed one. It means chosen one. It means special one. It means strong one. In the prophecies in the Old Testament. Many of them talk about this strong Messiah, someone who would come. 
and set the world to rights, end all oppression, throw off the people that were the oppressors in this case of the people of God. That's what they were looking for in all the Old Testament. There's many, many verses. I'm just going to pair or quote two. Two of the biggest um, messianic psalms, Psalm 2 and Psalm 10. You will break the nations with a rod of iron. You will dash them to pieces like pottery. This is the promise that the Messiah is going to come and he's going to set the world to rights. He's going to put down the enemies of the people of God. Psalm 110, the most quoted psalm in the Old Testament passage in the New Testament. He will judge the nations and crush the rulers of the whole earth. So what they were waiting for, in this, and there's many, many, a profile of the, old, of the Messiah in the Old Testament, was a reigning king, a conquering king who would come and set the world to rights. But that's not the full picture. There's another portion. Before the resurrection, they were expecting, let me say this, they were expecting a Messiah, a strong Messiah for a strong people, not a weak Messiah for people who admit they're weak, not a broken Messiah for people who are broken. But before the resurrection... No one saw this coming, right? No one saw it coming. No one was looking for it because they were looking like we all do. We look for what we've planned on seeing. What I'm interested in right now is the Messiah is going to throw the Romans off my back. I'm looking for a Messiah who's going to set the world to rights. I'm looking for a God who's going to solve my problems. But that's not the one that they got. No one's, Jesus opens their eyes to other portions of the Old Testament to the other role of the Messiah. Isaiah 53 is a good example. These verses were always there. They just weren't looking at them. Surely, this is about the Messiah, the servant he's called in Isaiah 53. He took up our pain and he bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. This is the Messiah prophecy. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment, the punishment, that's the cross. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds we are healed. Listen, he will be a reigning king. He will crush the uh, rulers of the whole earth. He will break the nations with a rod of iron. We call that in Bible speak the second coming. But before he's a reigning king, he's a suffering servant. This is why the gospel is actually considered good news, right? It's the central message of the whole Bible. And once you see it, once your eyes are open to it, you see everything in a new light. Let me give you an example. No one saw it coming. I could give a hundred examples. I'll give you three quick ones. Jacob, the grandson of Abraham. Now, if you know his story in the book of the opening book of the Bible, he deceived his father. He stole his brother's birthright and his blessing. He would have done what you'd call from the moral of God a lot of things that were wrong. And because of that, he was exposed. He had to leave on the run from the promised land in the dead of night. He leaves the promised land. It's like you get what you want, but you can't really enjoy it. And he leaves with nothing but the clothes on his back and the way the description is talked about in Genesis 28. He goes until he runs out of energy, like until he can't run anymore. Nobody's behind him. And he falls asleep just in the middle of the open field. And it says he has a stone as a pillow. Kind of make a point. He had nothing. And in that moment, he has a vision that changes his life from God. The the great vision of of the ladder of angels. But guess what? This vision wasn't what you thought it would be. It wasn't, boy, are you in trouble? You, I saw everything you did, and, and you're going to have to pay uh, the cost. This is the Lord. And the Lord says, listen, never mentions anything about what happened the, with his brother and his father. He said, listen, Jacob, I want you to know who I am. I'm the God of Isaac. I'm the God of Abraham. I'm your God. I love you. And what I promised Isaac and what I promised Abraham, I'm going to bless the whole world. I'm gonna, you are my choice. You are my chosen one. Every square inch of this promised land, it's going to be yours, and you're going to change the world. I promise you. Jacob did not see that coming. That's the gospel. Or how about 1,700 years later when Israel is trying to anoint a new king 
because the first king was so self-centered and selfish and, 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 and self-defeated, and all of a sudden God says to the prophet, I got another person in mind. I, got a, I found this person. I want you to take a sacrifice, and I want you to go to a little town of Bethlehem, and I want you to anoint somebody. And Samuel the prophet says, Lord, are you, well, I want to do whatever you tell me, but I can't do that because if the, king, the, the reigning king, the current king, finds out I'm going, I'll be toast. And God says, I'll protect you. Just go. Anoint, I'm going to anoint another king. So he goes and does what he's told. He goes to the house of Jesse. He says, Jesse, listen. Doesn't even tell Jesse what he's doing. We're going to have a sacrifice. Call all your sons. They do what the prophet tells them. So Jesse calls all of his sons, and even the prophet is confused. He sees the seven sons of Jesse. He looks at the first one. His name is Eliab. He's, he's, he's a head taller than everyone. He's, he's a strapping, handsome young man. He says, that's the one. He says to himself, recorded in 1 Samuel, he's the one. And the Lord says back to him, nope. Hmm. You know, you feel like, I want my job to be done. I'm going to go home. And he goes from the first all the way down to seven in a row, and God says, nope, nope, nope. And then he says, now what am I going to do? And he says to Sam, he says to, to Jesse, the man he went to, and he said, do you have any other kids? Like, I'm, I'm out of options. He said, well, there's, we have one more, but I didn't even bother calling him. He's a teenager. He's, you know, he's, he's doing the dirty work, and he said, well, call him. We can't do anything until he comes. And he comes, little David, probably a very young man, maybe even a teenager, and the Lord says, that's the one. Anoint him king of Israel. I promise you, I promise you, David never saw that coming. And how about a thousand years later? This is the ultimate one. God wants to not just send a prophet. doesn't want to just anoint a king. He wants to bring his own son into the world. Call it Christmas or the incarnation. And for this job, he doesn't send a prophet. He sends an angel. Gabriel, okay, and he sends this angel not to Jerusalem, not to Paris, not to New York City, not to Harvard. He sends this angel to a town called Nazareth, middle of nowhere, to a teenage girl. Can you imagine getting the knock on the door, Luke chapter 2? And she opens the door, and it's an archangel of God and says, oh, by the way, the Lord sent me. You are going to... Uh, uh, give birth to the Son of God. I promise you, I promise you, Mary never saw that coming, okay? This is what the gospel is. This is what the resurrection means. This is what the life to come means. But it's important to keep in mind that the religious leaders of Jesus' day were not the only people that got the Messiah wrong, who get God wrong. Many people today... Okay, think about your own life or mine. Many people today, both outside the church, inside the church, are worshiping a God of their own making. One who conforms to their own ideas of what is good or what is right and what is true. But I'm here to say, I think this passage is here to say, he didn't come to make your life better. He didn't come to make your life easier. He came to suffer and die for your sins so you could be forgiven and have not a better life, a whole new kind of life. But the gospel is not something you grow into like a pair of pants. The gospel is not something you see coming. It's a sheer gift of God. It's a whole new way of being. That's what Jesus is saying here. It's a life beyond belief. It's far better than you ever imagined. You can't see it coming until it does. And finally, this passage tells us, it's powered by love. It's powered by love, a, a particular kind of love. I don't know how many of you know this, um, many of you do more than you did a year ago, the name Brock Purdy. Brock Purdy was one of the two quarterbacks in the recent Super Bowl, San Francisco 49ers, and it's a pretty big deal. They lost the game, but it was pretty close. But two years ago, I promise you, nobody heard of this guy. In fact, two years ago in 2022, when they have the draft, if you know anything about football, they draft people from college, he was the very last person picked. You know, we all joke about the dodgeball thing. You don't want to be the last person. He was the very last person, number 262 of 262. And if you get that unhappy designation, they call you what? Oh, you guys are so good. Mr. Irrelevant. Think about that. Now, you and I laugh about it because it's not you or me. 
but he was designated, see some of you know this because it's common knowledge, all over the NFL, but I mean in popular culture, as, can you imagine? And for a whole year, a whole year of his life, he kind of went with it. He's a, you know, 23-year-old kid, 22-year-old kid at the time, and they, you know, they joke about it. Mr. Irrelevant, picked last in the draft. He, he said, okay, you know, he went with it. He was glad to be, uh, glad to be picked. 2022-23 20, season, some of you know this story, QB1 gets hurt, QB2 gets hurt, and he gets, they only got three, he gets in, wins some games. Next year, which was the last season, he's the starting quarterback, he takes them all the way to the Super Bowl. Now because of that, now a week or two before the Super Bowl, this guy's all over, you know, getting interviewed everywhere. Because it's the most unbelievable rags to riches story you ever saw, and he's sitting in front of all these cameras, and no one even knew who he was, and asking him all these questions. And he, I, I, there's several interviews, you may have seen somebody, he said this, and one of them he said, listen, guys. He said, they, they kept saying, it's all about the pressure. How are you going to handle this pressure? How are you going to handle this pressure? How are you going to handle this pressure? He says, I want you to know something. Um, I've been dreaming about this my whole life. This is the dream come true. I've been thinking about uh, being, playing in the Super Bowl. Never thought I would do it, but it's been, it's been my dream my entire life. This is unbelievable. But he said, I have to tell you this. It's not number one. God is number one. And he said, my family's number two. He was speaking of his mom and his dad. And he said, football's number three. Now, you'd think the, the press would be smart enough to say, let's change the subject. <laughs> but some guy asked him another question about his faith. After that, and this is what he said. This is a direct quote. I don't need to win this game to feel loved or to be loved because I am loved by Jesus already. That's exactly what this point of Jesus is. Think about what Jesus does here. He, two times in these verses I read, he shows them his hands and his feet. Now, you're supposed to take that and read that and go, what is that about? I mean, you think he rose from the dead, it's all amazing, he looks good, it's me, myself, how about a hug? How about an old story? How about a, you didn't see that one coming. He says, he shows them his hands and his feet. Why do that? And what's the, what is the, why would you, if you were God, the person who made this whole uh, story, the whole, that created this whole event, why would you not only do that, but why would you, if, if we believe this text as it is straightforward written, Jesus is in his glorified body and the same body he had then is the one he has now. If you and I believe all this and we see him in heaven someday, it's going to be the same one he has here. When this world is over, Revelation 22 and 21, when it's all over and we're singing hallelujah for, you know, as this hymn says, for a thousand years or a million years, a million years from now, the heaven will be populated with people from every tribe, every nation, every tongue, every ethnicity, every skin color, you name it, perfected, perfect, living in a glorified body. They will be like that. They will maintain a certain amount of their personality, maintain their ethnicity in a sense. That's what it says in Revelation 7. There will be only one person, okay? One person who's got marks from the old life and they're the hands, the marks in his hands and his feet. Why? Why make that a permanent part a permanent, eternal part of us for everybody. The reason is so that all people in all of history would know, we're 2,000 years into this story, and all of eternity would know there's only one reason that anybody makes it into the kingdom of God. It's that love, right? It's that love. I don't need to fill in the blank. I don't need to do this, achieve that, accomplish that, I don't need to do anything to, to feel loved or to be loved because I'm loved already in Jesus. This is the message of the resurrection. Amen? Amen. And what I want to say to us now, I want us all to think about that as an invitation. And I'm not just talking about guests or friends, all of us, to think about the hands and the feet of Jesus, right? He showed them his hands and his feet. I mean, it's hard to believe. It's, it's beyond belief. So I'm, tell, I'm telling you a story. Uh, at the resurrection of life beyond belief. But if you can believe it, if you can find your heart and mind to get there, 
You will one day, if you know Jesus as your Savior, you will see those hands. You will see those feet. And they will say to you, maybe more than you know today or will know tomorrow, that you are loved. There's no greater way to say, you are loved. I did this for you. Amen? So let's pray. And I want to I encourage all of us to respond in a way. Let me start with you. If you're here this morning, then you'd say, you know, Rob, uh, thanks for those words. I've been to church before or haven't been to church before. And I've heard about, of course, uh, I've heard the story of, you know, the cross or I've seen it. I've even heard that the belief is that someone rose from the dead or Jesus rose from the dead, but I've never really understood the point of it. I never understood the why of it, that he came on a rescue mission, and he did it uh, to, to, on, on our behalf. He lived the life you couldn't live. He died in your place in a manner of speaking. In other words, he took the judgment of sin that belonged to me, that belonged to you, that belonged to every person. He was a substitute, a sacrifice, not on an altar, but on a, on a, on a cross. Not an animal, but a, but a human being for the sins of the world. And if you'd say, first time I've seen it, first time I've come to understand it, how do I receive it? You just, you just ask for it. John 1, 12, to as many as received him, to them he gave the power to become the sons and daughters of God. It's a gift. You don't earn it. You don't grow into it. It's a gift. All you need to do is ask for it. Another verse says, if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our hearts, See how simple that is. Believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, then we can be saved. All you need to do where you sit in the quiet of your own seat is simply ask for it. And I would just encourage you in your own words, in your own way to do that right here, right now. But for the rest of us, if you've been a Christian for many years, there's a, there's, a, there's a message here for us too. This life, it doesn't begin the day you die. This life, he says in those last verses, wait here until you receive power, the promise, the power from on high, the resurrection life, the, the future life, the life to come, it begins today. We have this life, you have this life. But let this be a reminder to us. He showed them his hands and feet that this life is empowered only one way. You don't earn it. You don't stair-step your way to it. It's empowered by love. Look at his hands and his feet. Allow his love, God's love, to motivate you, to capture your imagination. Help us, Lord, to know that we don't need to do anything to feel loved or to be loved. We are loved. And may we live more fully out of it. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, Amen friends. Just a couple things.